Okay, we'll start with this per some recent announcements that were made today. French on Cruz versus Aline Cedarouz. The undisputed super middleweight title fight has been added to the Taylor versus Serrano card set to go down on April 30th. In addition to that, they've added Jesse Vargas versus Liam Beefy Smith to the card as well. And the card is shaping up nicely. Comes to the undisputed super middleweight title fight. It took some doing to get here to get to this point to where the fight is signed, sealed, and shortly will be delivered. Those of you might remember, might recall that this fight was originally supposed to go down on the undercard of Lopez versus Cambosos back when Triller had the rights to that fight. But we all know what happened. It took them too long to deliver. They were found in default by the IBF and the fight went over to Matchroom, which was the second highest bidder in the purse bid. A nice stage to Lopez versus Cambosos fight. And we all know what happened. We know the fight's outcome and that fight's repercussions, though this fight was not featured on that card. But here it is, set to go down on the undercard of Taylor versus Serrano, April 30th. And we're going to get into a full fight breakdown as the fight date approaches. Winner of this fight should be a person of interest to Christina Hammer. 31-year-old former unified middleweight champion Christina Hammer, who has since fought as a super middleweight, made her Wasserman debut. The winner of this fight should be a person of interest to Christina Hammer. Because outside of the winner of this fight, what the hell else is she gonna do? The winner of this fight is a person of interest to unbeaten up-and-comer Jean Deja Green. And she said as much not but a few days ago. I think that the winner of this fight should be, in theory, a person of interest to Costa Rica's own multi-weight champion, multiple times as well, Hannah. Hannah Gabriels, because in a capable fighter that she might be, experienced fighter that she might be, she hasn't been very active, she hasn't been very busy, and the winner of this fight is her best bet to participate in a big fight anywhere at or around these weights. See, essentially what I'm getting at is, heavy is the head that wears the crown. That's what they say. And the fighters fighting at these weights, they really can't afford to stay away from each other but this fight happening on the platform that it's happening on the undercard it's taking place on a major platform as part of a major promotion a major fight for a lot of girls at or around these weights this would be the biggest stage they've ever fought on and the winner of this fight will be the biggest name they can aspire to fight anywhere at or around these weights. If you're talking about Anna Gabriel, Shot Deja Green, Christina Hammer, the winner of this fight, in theory, should be a person of interest. Because if you're not trying to fight the winner of this fight, what the hell are you doing? Looking forward to seeing this on April 30th. In addition to this, Jesse Vargas versus Liam Beefy Smith has been added to the card. We've heard about this fight off and on for well over a year now, and it's finally here. It's finally set to go down on April 30th. You know, it's been a very long time since former WBO welterweight champion Jesse Vargas had a fight, now campaigning well above welterweight. You know, Jesse Vargas hasn't fought in two years. You know that, right? Right. Jesse Vargas hasn't had a fight since February of 2020, two years ago, before COVID, right before COVID, shut everything down. That's how long Jesse's been out of action yeah. You know, I heard something about Jesse Vargas getting into politics. Something to fall back on in case things go sideways with Liam Beefy Smith. It's been a very long time since Jesse fought anybody. Jesse was always a very good boxer, not the biggest puncher, not at 140 pounds or at 147, much less. I think this is a junior middleweight contest. Oh, well, last time Jesse saw action was once, just once in 2020 before COVID shut everything down. In 2020, Liam Smith, he didn't see any action. He didn't have any fight the whole of 2020, but last year, in 2021, he saw action two times, once in Russia against Magomed Kurbanov, who was awarded a rather dubious decision over Liam Beefy Smith, but Liam, he capped off the year by getting himself back in the winner's bracket in his own neck of the woods against Anthony Fowler, who he stopped. Who he stopped in eight rounds. The both of these guys are former champions, the both of these guys are vets, they're veterans, the both of them, lots of experience over quality operators, some wins, some losses. Is they know what it's like to be on both sides of that fence. Though I will say sharpness has to go to Liam because Liam has seen action in the last 12 months. He has seen action previous year at least two times. Whereas Jesse, Jesse's been out of action for two years already. The night of the fight, it will have been well over two years since Jesse fought anybody. And, and Jesse's not like Beefy, you know. Jesse's always been statuesque for 140 and 147 pounds. But at junior middleweight, 
I think the edge in power might have to actually go to Liam Beefy Smith. Certainly the edge in experience. Experience at this weight is what I mean. Liam Beefy Smith is a naturally bigger guy than Jesse Vargas, I think. Perhaps even a naturally bigger puncher. Jesse Vargas is bread and butter, and his out in this fight is boxing, his boxing acumen. It's going to be interesting to see that. You have to wonder what it's going to lead to, though, because... In a junior middleweight division, all the belts, and I mean all the belts, all the alphabet titles, they're all tied up, and they're all at PBC Island between Brian Castaño and Jermel Charlo, their rematch. All the belts are going to be on the line in that fight. And with things being as political as they are in today's boxing world, at 154 pounds, you wonder, what does the winner of this fight move on to do? Because there are no world titles they can fight for at this time, given the political boundary lines that divide. Wouldn't mind seeing the winner of this fight fighting Tim Zhu. And while we're on the subject of Tim Zhu, I wouldn't mind seeing Tim Zhu fighting the winner of Kurbanov versus Teixeira. A fight that was supposed to go down last year, but you know, extenuating circumstances, things happen, and it has since been rescheduled. It's supposed to be going down in March. Around the same time that the Charlo versus Castaño rematch is supposed to be going down. Same month. I've said this before and I'll say it again. The way I see it, Tim Zhu's not going to get the chance to fight the winner of Castaño versus Jermel Charlo unless the winner of that fight is Brian Castaño, who I think if he wins the fight, he'll stay at junior middleweight. He will. But if it's Jermel Charlo who wins, he'll win that fight and he will subsequently vacate all those titles and then move up to middleweight, at which point his brother, Jermel, will move up to super middleweight. And I actually think Jermel Charlo is going to win that fight. I think he might knock out Brian Castaño. So in a scenario like that where it's Jermel that emerges the victor, Jermel, who becomes that division's undisputed champion, if he vacates all those belts, Tim Zhu's still owed a title shot. He's going to have to fight somebody. Why can't that somebody be the winner of Kurbanov versus Teixeira? Makes for a great fight. And then let the winner of that fight face the winner of Smith versus Vargas. Just prelude, a preview, into what could be the landscape at 154 pounds beyond Charlo versus Castaño 2. In heavyweight news per tweet from Michael Benson, the WBA have now officially ordered Trevor Bryan to defend his WBA regular heavyweight belt versus Daniel Dubois next. And the fight must take place within 180 days of Bryan's fight on Saturday by July 28th. They have also ordered Robert Hellenius versus Huey Fury. As an eliminator, we'll see what happens with that, because depending on what happens, the winner of Robert Hellenius versus Huey Fury might see themselves fighting the winner of... Dubois versus Bryan. You gotta give it to old fish eyes Frank Warren. He's done a pretty good job with Daniel Dubois in victory and defeat. We know that, you know, he took on Joe Joyce, his countryman, in what was a domestic battle of the unbeatens. It didn't go Daniel's way, but he has since rebounded off that loss. He fought two times last year, two times. He fought Bogdan Dino in his big comeback fight. He stopped Bogdan in two rounds. He then took on Joe Kusumano on the undercard of Jake Paul versus Tyrone Woodley. He fought Joe Kusumano and he stopped him in one round. All of one round. Just one round. Old Fish Eyes Frank Warren cut him loose and let him fight on that undercard here stateside and he racked up a nice first round knockout. Now, he could be looking at a fight with Don King's own unbeaten contender Trevor Bryan. Will Don King get in the way of this fight? He tried to, but if he screws the pooch, it'll come at the expense of his guy, his fighter. Because this is an order, you understand. Trevor Bryan is under orders to face Daniel Dubois. It's not much to it. Trevor Bryan was in action this past weekend on the undercard of Makabu versus Machunu 2. He took on unbeaten shrimper Jonathan Guidry. You want to split decision over 12 rounds. Jonathan Guidry is a far cry from what Trevor Bryan will face in young Daniel Dubois. Young Daniel Dubois, who's now being trained by Shane McGuigan. In case you guys forgot, that's right, the expertise of Shane McGuigan is now in Daniel Dubois' corner. I see that Frank Warren's moving his pieces on the board is what he's doing. I see it. I fucking see it. By way of the WBA, you've got Daniel Dubois in position to become the WBA's mandatory challenger, provided he makes his way past Trevor Bryan. And I think he can. I think he will when the fight goes down. So, old fish eyes Frank Warren... He's got Daniel Dubois in position by way of WBA, getting into position. By way of the WBO, he's got Smoke and Joe Joyce. Those are two of his prized horses, two of his prized stallions. 
in the heavyweight division. And because of Frank's relationship with Bob, so long as Frank's boys are in that world title picture, so long as they're in world title contention, then so is Bob Arum. Not exclusive to what ends up happening between Tyson Fury and Dillian Vite. Whatever does or doesn't happen because Dillian Vite based on reports, hasn't signed the contract. Some weeks ago and months, I told you that, you know, the winner of Joshua versus Yusuk 2, whoever it ends up being, even if they move straight into an undisputed title fight thereafter, the winner of that fight, whoever it is, whoever the last man standing is when the smoke settles, is going to have their work cut out for them. Because on one end, you've got Joe Joyce. On the other, you may have Daniel Dubois. And Philippe Pergovic, he's still out there. By way of the IBF. Just feels like everything we've been seeing from the IBF the last couple of weeks is an inexorable countdown to an order that we'll see Philippe Pergovic fighting Zile Zhang for a Mando spot by way of the IBF. The boys are getting in position for what could be this era's undisputed heavyweight champion. Whoever that ends up being. So it's interesting, though. We don't want to get too far ahead, too ahead of ourselves. First, Daniel Dubois has got to make it past Trevor Bryan. The fight has to take place within the next 180 days. This is likely going to be Daniel's first fight of 2022. Trevor's already had his, and I think he's very close to losing that WBA baby belt, losing that secondary title, because I have Daniel Dubois knocking him out. And just in keeping with the theme of heavyweight news, per tweet from Michael Benson, Joseph Parker's manager, David Higgins, has revealed that Joe Joyce's team have reached out and said they're going to make them an offer for a potential heavyweight fight in May. This is the same Joseph Parker that walked away from an IBF final eliminator against Ferlie Pergovic, citing the money as the issue. And I told you guys, I told you. Money's not the issue, risks are the issue. They're not willing to take on those kinds of risks, the risks associated with a Flea Pergovic for that kind of money, whatever that kind of money was. It's not enough to get Joe Parker in the ring with Philippe Pergovic. It's not the money, it's the risk. Because if they offered you that same money to fight an Alex Lapai in a final eliminator, you'd fight him. If they offered you the same kind of money they're offering for Philippe Pergovic to fight, say, Sean Del Winters in an IBF final eliminator that could see you becoming the IBF's mandatory challenger, you'd take that money and you'd take that fight. But because the Philippe Pergovic fight... It's a riskier fight than any of those fights. They'll tell you it's the money, but in reality, it's the risks associated with that fight. It's for this reason that they've gone as far as saying they'd like to pursue a Andy Ruiz rematch. Andy Ruiz, who Joseph Parker outpointed, outpointed by the skin of his teeth in his own neck of the woods. It's for this reason they're looking at that guy after having already passed on a Philippe Pergovic IBF final eliminator. I will say that if they end up fighting Joe Joyce, I can forgive Joseph for walking away from Philippe. You heard that right. If by some chance you can get Joe Boxer Parker in the ring with Joe Joyce for May of this year, if they can get that fight over the line, I'd be willing to forgive Joseph Parker passing on that Philippe Pergovic IBF final eliminator. The risks are about the same. That's right. The risks you run in facing Philippe Pergovic are about the same as the risks you run fighting Joe Joyce. You do realize those guys... They competed as amateurs. Philippe Pergovic emerged from the Olympics with the bronze, and Joe Joyce emerged from the Olympics with the silver, the silver medal. Francis Tony Yoka got the gold. Some people feel he didn't deserve it, though that's neither here nor there when it comes to this situation, this potential matchup, this potential fight between Joe Boxer Parker and Joe Boxer Joyce. It's the battle of the Joes. Though not the average ones. Joe Boxer Parker is a former heavyweight champion. Heavyweight champion, that's what Joe Joyce aspires to be. And he needs a name, a big name. He made it past his domestic rival and his stablemate, Daniel Dubois. And, you know, he's already beaten a former champion in Bermain Stiverne, already beaten a former world title challenger in Bryant Jennings. Joe Joyce versus Joe Parker is a good fucking fight. So if the money offered up for a Philippe Pergovic IBF final eliminator wasn't enough to entice Joe Boxer Parker to take the fight, what are the odds that the money they offer up for Joe Joyce? What are the odds that'll entice Joe Boxer Parker to take up the fight? Not much mystery here, no sleight of hand. You're going to have to offer up more money for a Joe Joyce fight than what was offered to Joe Boxer Parker for that Philippe Pergovic fight. You're going to have to offer him more money than was offered to him to face Philippe. That being said, what are the odds of that happening? That's the question.
I feel like Joseph Parker's fought everybody he can fight on the matchroom side of things. With the exception of Philippe Pergovic, who he walked away from because he didn't like the money. I don't think the money for a Zile Zhang fight is any better than the money for a Philippe Pergovic fight. And I don't think Joe Boxer Parker is in the market for a Zile Zhang fight. Zile Zhang, who needs names just as much as Philippe Pergovic needs names. Just as much as Joe Joyce needs names. It's a very interesting fight it is. Joe's coming off that win over Derek Chisora in their rematch. The uppercut was what won him the fight, in my opinion. A bit more aggression and a well-timed, well-placed uppercut. That made all the difference against Derek Chisora, but Joe Joyce, that's a different kettle of fish. Joe's got a great chin and a great engine for a guy his size. He doesn't seem to tire. He can keep throwing punches throughout the course of a match, going the distance. He can keep the pressure on keep it coming. It's a very different dynamic than what we saw in the Derek Chisoria fight, because Derek Chisoria, he's aggressive like Joe, though he's more of a come forward, bob and weave kind of guy, whereas Joe... And that's why the uppercut was so effective for Joseph Parker. Derek Chisoria being that come forward, bob and weave guy makes him more susceptible to that uppercut, whereas Joe Juggernaut Joyce, that's not gonna work. Unless I'm mistaken, there's a height differential there, and Joe Joyce is the taller guy. Joe Joyce might have a bit of height bit of reach over Joe Boxer Parker, I think he does, and Joe Joyce ain't the kind of guy that hunkers down, fights at a slight crouch when he comes forward and applies that pressure. It is a different kettle of fish. Yeah, he don't fight at a slight crouch the same way Derek Chisora does. Joe Juggernaut Joyce is a little bit more upright, and perhaps that's why his defense seems leaky at times. Sometimes he seems very hittable. Joseph Parker, he definitely showed improvement in that Derek Chisora rematch. He did, but that's essentially a guy he had to fight two times in order to get one, one decisive victory because I don't think he earned that decision in the first fight. I don't. What you gotta do for Joe Joyce ain't what you gotta do or what you did with Derek Chisora. It is different and the risks are high. The risks are palpable. It's an excellent fucking fight if they can make it. Though making it is contingent upon whatever it is they offer Joe. And Joe, Joe wants big money. 